Chapter 50. Jason. A wolf launched itself at Jason. He stepped back and swung his scrap wood into the beast's snout with a satisfying crack. Maybe only silver could kill it, but a good old-fashioned board could still give it a headache. He turned towards the sound of hooves and saw a storm spirit horse bearing down on him. Jason concentrated and summoned the wind. Just before the spirit could trample him, Jason launched himself into the air, grabbed the horse's smoky neck and pirouetted onto its back. The storm spirit reared. It tried to shake Jason and then tried to dissolve into mist to lose him, but somehow Jason stayed on. He willed the horse to remain in solid form and the horse seemed unable to refuse. Jason could feel it fighting against him. He could sense its raging thoughts, complete chaos straining to break free. It took all Jason's willpower to impose his own wishes and bring the horse under control. He fought about Aeolus, overseeing thousands and thousands of spirits like this, some much worse. No wonder the master of the winds had gone a little mad after centuries of that pressure. But Jason had only one spirit to master, and he had to win. You're mine now, Jason said. The horse bucked, but Jason held fast. Its mane flickered as it circled around the empty pool, its hooves causing miniature thunderstorms, tempests, whenever they touched. Tempest? Jason said. Is that your name? The horse spirit shook its mane, evidently pleased to be recognised. Fine, Jason said. Now, let's fight. He charged into battle, swinging his icy piece of wood, knocking aside wolves and plunging straight through other venti. Tempest was a strong spirit, and every time he ploughed through one of his brethren, he discharged so much electricity the other spirit vaporised into a harmless cloud of mist. Through the chaos, Jason caught glimpses of his friends. Piper was surrounded by Earthborn, but she seemed to be holding her own. She was so impressive looking as she fought, almost glowing with beauty, that the Earthborn stared at her in awe, forgetting that they were supposed to kill her. They'd lower their clubs and watch dumbfounded as she smiled and charged them. They'd smile back until she sliced them apart with her dagger and they melted into mounds of mud. Leo had taken on Kione herself. While fighting a goddess should have been suicide, Leo was the right man for the job. She kept summoning ice daggers to throw at him, blasts of winter air, tornadoes of snow. Leo burned through all of it. His whole body flickered with red, t red tongues of flame, like he'd been doused with gasoline. He advanced on the goddess, using two silver-tipped blacksmith's hammers to smash any monsters that got in his way. Jason realised that Leo was the only reason they were still alive. His fiery aura was heating up the whole courtyard, countering Keone's winter magic. Without him, they would have been frozen like the hunters long ago. Wherever Leo went, ice melted off the stones. Even Thalia started to defrost a little when Leo stepped near her. Keanu, Keanu slowly backed away. Her expression went from enraged to shocked to slightly panicked as Leo got closer. Jason was running out of enemies. Wolves lay in dazed heaps. Some slunk away in the ruins, yelping from their wounds. Piper stabbed the last Earthborn, who toppled to the ground in a pile of sludge. Jason rode Tempest through the last Ventus, breaking it into vapour, and then he wheeled around and saw Leo bearing down on the Goddess of Snow. You're too late, Keone snarled. He's awake, and don't think you've won anything here, demigods. Hera's plan will never work. You'll be at each other's throats before you can ever stop us. Leo set his hammers ablaze and threw them at the goddess, but she turned into snow, a white powdery image of herself. Leo's hammers slammed into the snow woman, breaking it into a, a steaming mound of mush. Piper was breathing hard, but she smiled up at Jason. Nice horse! Tempest reared on his hind legs, arcing electricity across his hooves, a complete show-off. Then Jason heard a cracking sound behind him. The melting ice on Hera's cage slowed, sloughed off in a curtain of slush, and the goddess called. Oh, don't mind me, just the queen of the heavens dying over here. Jason dismounted and told Tempest to stay put. The three demigods jumped into the pool and ran to the spire. Leo frowned. Uh, Tia Kalida, are you getting shorter? No, you don't. The earth is claiming me. Hurry. As much as Jason disliked Hera, what he saw inside the cage alarmed him. Not only was Hera sinking, the ground was rising around her like water in a tank. Liquid rock had already covered her shins. The giant wakes, Hera warned. You only have seconds. On it, Leo said. Piper, I need your help. Talk to the cage. What? She said. Talk to it. Use everything you've got. Convince Gaia to sleep. Lull her into a daze. Just slow her down. Try to get the tendrils to loosen while I... Right. Piper cleared her throat and said, Hey, uh, Gaia. Nice night, huh? Boy, I'm tired. How about you? Ready for some sleep? The more she talked, the more confident she sounded. Jason felt his own eyes getting heavy, and he had to force himself not to focus on her words. It seemed to have some effect on the cage. The mud was rising more slowly. The tendrils seemed to soften just a little, becoming more like tree root than rock. 
Leo pulled a circular saw out of his tool belt. How it fitted in there, Jason had no idea. Then, Leo looked at the cord and grunted in frustration. I don't have anywhere to plug it in. The spirit horse Tempest jumped into the pit and whinnied. Really? Jason asked. Tempest dipped his head and trotted over to Leo. Leo looked dubious, but he held up the plug and a breeze whisked into the horse's flank. Lightning, lightning sparked, connecting with the prongs of the plug and the circular saw whirred to life. Sweet, Leo grinned. Your horse comes with AC outlets. Their good mood didn't last long. On the other side of the pool, the giant spire crumbled with a sound like a tree snapping in half. Its outer sheaf of tendrils exploded from the top down, raining stone and wood shards as the giant shook himself free and climbed out of the earth. Jason hadn't thought anything could be scarier than Enceladus. He was wrong. Porphyrian was even taller and even more ripped. He didn't radiate heat or show any signs of breathing fire, but there was something more terrible about him. A kind of strength, even magnetism, as if the giant was so huge and dense, he had his own gravitational field. Like Enceladus, the giant king was humanoid from the waist up, clad in bronze armour, and from the waist down he had scaly dragon's legs, but his skin was the colour of lima beans. His hair was green as summer leaves, braided in long locks and decorated with weapons, daggers, axes and full-size swords, some of them bent and bloody, maybe trophies taken from demigods eons of before. When the giant opened his eyes, they were blank white, like polished marble. He took a deep breath. Alive, he bellowed. Praise to Gaia. Jason made a heroic little whimpering sound he hoped his friends couldn't hear. He was very sure no demigod could also slow solo this guy. Porphyrian could lift mountains. He could crush Jason with one finger. Leo, Jason said. Huh? Leo's mouth was wide open. Even Piper seemed dazed. You guys keep working, Jason said. Get Hera free. What are you going to do? Piper asked. You can't seriously entertain a giant? Jason said. I've got no choice. Excellent, the giant roared as Jason approached. An appetizer. Who are you, Hermes? Ares? Jason thought about going with that idea, but something told him not to. I'm Jason Grace, he said. Son of Jupiter. Those white eyes bored into him. Behind him, Leo's circular saw whirred and Piper talked to the cage in soothing tones, trying to keep the fear out of her voice. Porphyrian threw back his head and laughed. Outstanding! He looked up at the cloudy night sky. So Zeus, you sacrifice a son to me? The gesture is appreciated, but it will not save you. The sky didn't even rumble. No help from above. Jason was on his own. He dropped his makeshift club. His hands were covered in splinters, but that didn't matter now. He had to buy Leo and Piper some time, and he couldn't do that without a proper weapon. It was time to act a whole lot more confident than he felt. If you knew who I was, Jason yelled up at the giant, you'd be worried about me, not my father. I hope you enjoyed your two and a half minutes of rebirth, giant, because I'm going to send you right back to Tartarus. The giant's eyes narrowed. He planted one foot outside the pool and crouched to get a better look at his opponent. So, we'll start by boasting, will we? Just like old times. Very well, demigod. I am Porphyrian, king of the giants, son of Gaia. In olden times I rose from Tartarus, the abyss of my father, to challenge the gods. To start the war, I stole Zeus's queen. He grinned at the gossip goddess's cage. Hello, Hera. My husband destroyed you once, monster, Hera said. He'll do it again. But he didn't, my dear. Zeus wasn't powerful enough to kill me. He had to rely on a puny demigod to help. And even then we almost won. This time we will complete what we started. Gaia is waking. She has provisioned us with many fine servants. Our armies will shake the earth and we will destroy you at the roots. You wouldn't dare, Hera said, but she was weakening. Jason could hear it in her voice. Piper kept whispering to the cage and Leo kept soaring, but the earth was still rising inside Hera's prison, covering her up to her waist. Oh yes, the giant said. The Titans sought to attack your new home in New York. Bold but ineffective. Gaia is wiser and more patient, and we, her greatest children, are much, much stronger than Kronos. We know how to kill you Olympians once and for all. You must be dug up completely like rotten trees, your oldest roots torn out and burned. The giant frowned at Piper and Leo, as if he just noticed them working at the cage. Jason stepped forward and yelled to get back Porphyrian's attention. You said a demigod killed you, he shouted. How, if we're so puny? Ha <laughs> ha, you think I would explain it to you? I was created by Zeus's replacement, born to destroy the land of the sky. I shall take his throne, I shall take his wife, or, if she will not have me, I will let the earth consume her life force. 
What you see before you, child, is only my weakened form. I will grow stronger by the hour until I am invincible. But I am ready, quite already quite capable of smashing you to a grease spot. He rose to his full height and held out his hand. A twenty-foot spear shot from the earth. He grasped it and then stomped the ground with his dragon's feet. The ruins shook. All around the courtyard, monsters started to regather. Storm spirits, wolves and earthborn, all answering the giant's king's call. Great, Leo muttered. We needed more enemies. Hurry, Hera said. I know, Leo snapped. Go to sleep, Cage, Piper said. Nice, sleepy Cage. Yes, I'm talking to a bunch of earthen tendrils. This isn't weird at all. Porphyrian raked his spear across the top of the ruins, destroying a chimney and spraying wood and stone across the courtyard. So, child of Zeus, I have finished my boasting. Now it's your turn. What were you saying about destroying me? Jason looked at the ring of monsters, waiting impatiently for their master's order to tear them to shreds. Leo's circular saw kept whirring and Piper kept talking, but it seemed hopeless. Hera's cage was almost completely filled with earth. I'm the son of Jupiter, he shouted, and just for effect he summoned the winds, rising a few feet off the ground. I'm a child of Rome, consul to demigods, praetor of the First Legion. Jason didn't know quite what he was saying, but he rattled off the words like he'd said them many times before. He held out his arms, showing the tattoo of the eagle and SPQR, and to his surprise, the giant seemed to recognise it. For a moment, Porphyrian actually looked uneasy. I slew the Trojan sea monster, Jason continued. I toppled the black throne of Kronos and destroyed the Titan Krios with my own hands, and now I'm going to destroy you, Porphyrian, and feed you to your own wolves. Wow, dude, Leo muttered. You been eating red meat? Jason launched himself at the giant, determined to tear him apart. The idea of fighting a 40-foot-tall immortal barehanded was so ridiculous even the giant seemed surprised. Half flying, half leaping, Jason landed on the giant's scaly reptilian knee and climbed up the giant's arm before Porphyrian even realised what had happened. You dare? The giant bellowed. Jason reached his shoulders and ripped a sword out of the giant's weapon-filled braids. He yelled, For Rome! and drove the sword into the nearest convenient target, the giant's massive ear. Lightning streaked out of the sky and blasted the sword, throwing Jason free. He rolled when he hit the ground. When he looked up, the giant was staggering. His hair was on fire and the side of his face was blackened from lightning. The sword had splintered in his ear. Golden ichor ran down his jaw. The other weapons were sparking and smouldering in his braids. Porphyrian almost fell. The circle of monsters let out a collective growl and moved forward. Wolves and ogres fixing their eyes to Jason. No! Porphyrian yelled. He regained his balance and glared at the demigod. I will kill him myself. The giant raised his spear and it began to glow. You want to play with lightning, boy? You forget I am the bane of Zeus. I was created to destroy your father, which means I know exactly what will kill you. Something in Porphyrian's voice told Jason he wasn't bluffing. Jason and his friends had a good run. The three of them had done amazing things, yeah, even heroic things. But as the giant raised his spear, Jason knew there was no way he could deflect this strike. This was the end. Got it, Leo yelled. Sleep, Piper said, so forcefully that the nearest wolves fell to the ground and began snoring. The stone and wood cage crumbled. Leo had soared through the base of the thickest tendril and apparently cut off the cage's connection to Gaia. The tendrils turned to dust. The mud around Hera disintegrated. The goddess grew in size, glowing with power. Yes, she said. She threw off her black robes to reveal a white gown, her arms bedecked with golden jewellery. Her face was, was both terrible and beautiful, and a golden crown glowed in her long black hair. Now I shall have my revenge. The giant Porphyrian backed away. He said nothing, but he gave Jason one last look of hatred. His message was clear. Another time. And then he slammed his spear against the earth, and the giant disappeared into the ground like he dropped down a chute. Around the courtyard, monsters began to panic and retreat, but there was no escape for them. Hera glowed brighter. She shouted, Cover your eyes, my heroes! But Jason was too much in shock. He understood too late. He watched as Hera turned into a supernova, exploding in a ring of force that vaporised every monster instantly. Jason fell, light searing into his mind, and his last thought was that his body was burning. Chapter 51. Piper. Jason! Piper kept calling his name as he, she held him, though she'd almost lost hope. He'd been unconscious for two minutes now. His body was steaming. His eyes rolled back in his head. She couldn't tell if he was even breathing. It's no use, child. Hera stood over them in her simple black robes and shawl. 
Piper hadn't seen the goddess go nuclear. Thankfully, she'd closed her eyes, but she could see the after effects. Every vestige of winter was gone from the valley, the signs of battle either. The monsters had been vaporised. The ruins had been restored to what they were before, still ruins, but with no evidence that they'd been overrun by a horde of wolves, storm spirits and six armed ogres. Even the hunters had been revived. Most waited at a respectful distance in the meadow, but Thalia knelt by Piper's side, her hand on Jason's forehead. Thalia glared up at the goddess. This is your fault. Do something. Do not address me that way, girl. I am the queen. Fix him. Hera's eyes flickered with power. I did warn him. I would never intentionally hurt the boy. He was to be my champion. I told them to close their eyes before I revealed my true form. Um, Leo frowned. True form is bad, right? So why did you do it? I unleashed my power to help you, fool, Hera cried. I became pure energy so I could disintegrate the monsters, restore this place, and even save these miserable hunters from the ice. But mortals can't look upon you in that form, Thalia shouted. You've killed him. Leo shook his head in dismay. That's what our prophecy meant. Death unleash, for, though through Hera's rage. Come on, lady. You're a goddess. Do some voodoo magic on him. Bring him back. Piper half heard their conversation, but mostly she was focused on Jason's face. He's breathing, she announced. Impossible, Hera said. I wish it were true, child, but no mortal has ever... Jason, Piper called, putting every bit of her willpower into his name. She could not lose him. Listen to me. You can do this. Come back. You're going to be fine. Nothing happened. Had she imagined his breath stirring? Healing is not a power of Aphrodite, Hera said regretfully. Even I cannot fix this girl. His mortal spirit... Jason, Piper said again, and she imagined her voice resonating through the earth all the way down to the underworld. Wake up. He gasped and his eyes flew open. For a moment they were full of light, glowing pure gold, and then the light faded and his eyes were normal again. What? What happened? Impossible, Hera said. Piper wrapped him in a hug until he groaned. Crushing me? Sorry, she said. So relieved she laughed while wiping a tear from her eye. Thalia gripped her brother's hand. How do you feel? Hot, he muttered. Mouth is dry. I saw something really terrible. That was Hera, Thalia grumbled. Her Majesty, the loose cannon. That's it, Thalia Grace, said the goddess. I will turn you into an aardvark, so help me. Stop it, you two, Piper said. Amazingly, they both shut up. Piper helped Jason to his feet and gave him the last nectar from their supplies. Now, Piper faced Thalia and Hera. Hera, your Majesty, we couldn't have rescu rescued you without the hunters. And Thalia, you have never would have seen Jason again. I wouldn't have met him if it weren't for Hera. You two make nice, because we've got bigger problems. They both glared at her, and for three long seconds, Piper wasn't sure which one of them was going to kill her first. Finally, Thalia grunted. You've got spirit, Piper. She pulled a silver card from her parka and tucked it into the pocket of Piper's snowboarding jacket. You ever want to be a hunter? Call me. We could use you. Hera crossed her arms. Fortunately for this hunter, you have a point, daughter of Aphrodite. She assessed Piper, as if seeing her clearly for the time. You wondered, Piper, why I chose you for this quest, why I didn't reveal your secret in the beginning, even when I knew Enceladus was using you. I must admit, until this moment, I was not sure. Something told me you would be vital to the quest. Now I see I was right. You're even stronger than I realised, and you are, the corre are correct about the dangers to come. We must work together. Piper's face felt warm. She wasn't sure how to respond to Hera's compliment, but Leo stepped in. Yeah, he said. I don't suppose that poor Fyrian guy just melted and died, huh? No, Hera agreed. By saving me and saving this place, you prevented Gaia from waking. You have bought us some time, but poor Fyrian has risen. He simply knew better than to stay here, especially since he was not has not yet regained his full power. Giants can only be killed by a combination of god and demigod, working together once you freed me. He ran away, Jason said. But to where? Hera didn't answer, but a sense of dread washed over Piper. She remembered what Porphyrian had said about killing the Olympians by pulling up their roots. Greece. She looked at Thalia's grim expression and guessed the hunter had come to the same conclusion. I need to find Annabeth, Thalia said. She has to know what's happened here. Thalia. Jason gripped her hand. We never got to talk about this place, or... I know. Her expression softened. I lost you here once. I don't want to leave you again, but we'll meet soon. I'll rendezvous you, back with you at her Camp Half-Blood. She glanced at Hera. You'll see them there safely? It's the least you can do. It's not your place to tell me. Queen Hera, Piper interceded. The goddess sighed. 
Fine, yes, be off with you, hunter. Thalia gave Jason a hug and said her goodbyes. When the hunters were gone, the courtyard seemed strangely quiet. The dry reflecting pool showed no sign of the earthen tendrils that had brought back the giant king or imprisoned hero. The night sky was clear and starry. The wind rustled in the redwoods. Piper thought about that night in Oklahoma when she and her dad had slept in Grandpa Tom's front yard. She thought about the night on the wilderness school dorm roof when Jason had kissed her, in her mist-altered memories anyway. Jason, what happened to you before? Here, she asked. I mean, I know your mum abandoned you, but you said it was sacred ground for demigods. Why? What happened after you were on your own? Jason shook his head uneasily. It's still murky. The wolves. You were given a destiny, Hera said. You were given into my service. Jason scowled. Because you forced my mum to do that. You couldn't stand knowing Zeus had two children with my mum. Knowing that he'd fallen for her twice. I was the price you demanded for leaving the rest of my family alone. It was the right choice for you as well, Jason. Hera insisted. The second time your mother managed to snare Zeus's affections, it was because she imagined him in a different aspect. The aspect of Jupiter. Never before had this happened. Two children, Greek and Roman, born into the same family. You had to be separated from Thalia. This is where all demigods of your kind start their journey. Of his kind? Piper asked. She means Roman, Jason said. Demigods are left here. We meet the she-wolf goddess, Luper, the same immortal wolf that raised Romulus and Remus. Hera nodded. And if you are strong enough, you live. But, Leo looked mystified. What happened after that? I mean, Jason never made it to camp. Not to camp half-blood, no, Hera agreed. Piper felt as if the sky was spiralling above her, making her dizzy. You went somewhere else. That's where you've been all these years. Somewhere else for demigods. But, but where? Jason turned to the goddess. The memories are coming back, but not the location. You're not going to tell me, are you? No, Hera said. This is part of your destiny, Jason. You must find your own way back, but when you do, you will unite the two great powers. You will give us hope against the giants, and more importantly, against Gaia herself. You want us to help you, Jason said, but you're holding back information. Giving you answers would make those answers invalid, Hera said. This is the way of the fates. You must forge your own path for it to mean anything. Already you three have surprised me. I would not have thought it possible. The goddess shook her head. Suffice to say, you have performed well, demigods, but this is only the beginning. Now you must return to Camp Half-Blood, where you will begin planning for the next phase. Which you won't tell us about, Jason grumped. And I suppose you destroyed my nice Storm Spirit horse, so we'll have to walk home. Here a wave decide the question. Storm Spirits are creatures of chaos. I did not destroy that one, though I have no idea where he went, or whether you'll see him again. But there is an easier way home for you, as you have done me a great service, so I can help you. At least this once. Farewell, demigods. For now. The world turned upside down, and Piper almost blacked out. When she could see straight again, she was back at camp, in the dining pavilion, in the middle of dinner. They were standing on the Aphrodite cabin's table, and Piper had one foot in Drew's pizza. Sixty campers rose at once, gawking at them in astonishment. Whatever Hera had done to shoot them across the country, it wasn't good for Piper's stomach. She could barely control her nausea. Leo wasn't so lucky. He jumped off the table, ran to the nearest bronze brazier, and threw up in it, which was probably not a great burnt offering for the gods. Jason. Chiron trotted forward. No doubt the old centaur had seen thousands of years' worth of weird stuff, but even he looked totally flabbergasted. What? How? The Aphrodite campers stared up at Piper, with their mouths open. Piper figured she must look awful. Hi, she said as casually as she could. We're back. Chapter 52 Piper Piper didn't remember much about the rest of the night. They told their story and answered a million questions from the other campers, but finally Chiron saw how tired they were and ordered them to bed. It felt so good to sleep on a real mattress, and Piper was so exhausted she crashed immediately, which spared her any worry about what it would be like returning to the Aphrodite cabin. The next morning she woke in her bunk, feeling re reinvigorated. The sun came through the windows along with a pleasant breeze. It might have been spring instead of winter. Birds sang, monsters howled in the woods, breakfast smells wafted from the dining pavilion, bacon, pancakes and all sorts of wonderful things. Drew and her gang were frowning down at her, their arms crossed. Morning. Piper sat up and smiled. A beautiful day. You're going to make us late for breakfast, Drew said, which means you get to clean the cabin for inspection. A week ago, Piper would have either punched Drew in the face or hidden back under her covers. 
Now she thought about the Cyclopses in Detroit, Medea in Chicago, Midas turning her to gold in Omaha, looking at Drew, who used to bother her. Piper laughed. Drew's smug expression crumbled. She backed up and then remembered she was supposed to be angry. What are you? Challenging you, Piper said. How about noon in the arena? You can choose the weapons. She got out of bed, stretched leisurely and beamed at her cabin mates. She spotted Mitchell and Lacey, who'd helped her pack for the quest. They were smiling tentatively, their eyes flitting from Piper to Drew like this might be a very interesting tennis game. I missed you guys, Piper announced. We're going to have a great time when I'm senior counsellor. Drew turned bug juice red. Even her closest lieutenants looked a little nervous. This wasn't in the script. You, Drew spluttered, you ugly little witch. I've been here the longest. You, you can't just challenge you, Piper said. Sure I can. Camp rules. I've been claimed by Aphrodite. I've completed a quest, which is one more than you've completed. If I feel I can do a better job, I can challenge you. Unless you just want to step down. Did I get all that right, Mitchell? Just right, Piper. Mitchell was grinning. Lacey was bouncing up and down like she was trying to achieve liftoff. A few of the other kids started to grin, as if they were enjoying the different colours Drew's face was turning. Step down, Drew shrieked. You're crazy. Piper shrugged. Then, fast as a viper, she pulled Catroptris from under her pillow, unsheathed the dagger and thrust the point under Drew's chin. Everybody else backed up fast. One guy crashed into a makeup table and sent up a plume of pink powder. A duel, then, Piper said cheerfully. If you don't want to wait until noon, now is fine. You've turned this cabin into a dictatorship, Drew. Selena Beauregard knew better than that. Aphrodite is about love and beauty. Being loving. Spreading beauty. Good friends, good times, good deeds. Not just looking good. Selena made mistakes, but in the end she stood by her friends. That's why she was a hero. I'm going to set things right. And I've got a feeling Mum will be on my side. Want to find out? Drew went cross-eyed looking down the blade of Piper's dagger. A second passed. Then two. Piper didn't care. She was absolutely happy and confident. It must have shown in her smile. I... I stepped down, Drew grumbled, but if you think I'm ever going to forget this, McLean... Oh, I hope you won't, Piper said. Now run, run along to the dining pavilion and explain to Kyron why we're late. There's been a change of leadership. Drew backed to the door. Even her closest lieutenants didn't follow her. She was about to leave when Piper said, Oh, and, and Drew, honey? The former counsellor looked back reluctantly. In case you think I'm not a true daughter of Aphrodite, Piper said, don't even look at Jason Grace. He may not know it yet, but he's mine. If you even try to make a move, I will load you into, ca into a catapult and shoot you across Long Island Sound. Drew turned around so fast she ran into the doorframe and then she was gone. The cabin was silent. The other campers stared at Piper. This was the part she was unsure of. She didn't want to rule by fear. She wasn't like Drew, but she didn't know if they'd accept her. Then spontaneously, the Aphrodite campers cheered so loudly they must have been heard all across camp. They herded Piper out of the cabin, raised her on their shoulders and carried her all the way to the dining pavilion, still in her pyjamas, her hair still a mess. But she didn't care. She'd never felt better. By afternoon, Piper had changed into comfortable camp clothes and led the Aphrodite cabin through their morning activities. She was ready for free time. Some of the buzz of her victory had faded because she had an appointment at the big house. Chiron met her on the front porch in human form, compacted into his wheelchair. Come inside, my dear. The video conference is ready. The only computer at camp was in Chiron's office and the whole room was shielded in bronze plating. Demigods and technology don't mix, Chiron explained. Phone calls, texting, even browsing the internet. All those things can attract monsters. Why, just this autumn at a school in Cincinnati, we had, a rescue, had to rescue a young hero who googled the Gorgons and got a little more than he bargained for. But never mind that. Here at camp, you're protected. Still, we try to be cautious. You'll only be able to talk for a few minutes. Got it, Piper said. Thank you, Chiron. He smiled and wheeled himself out of the office. Piper hesitated before clicking the call button. Chiron's office had a cluttered, cosy feel. One wall was covered with t-shirts from different conventions. Party Ponies 09 Vegas, Party Ponies 10 Honolulu, etc. Piper didn't know who the Party Ponies were, but judging from the stains, scorch marks and weapon holes in the t-shirts, they must have had some pretty wild meetings. On the shelf over Chiron's desk sat an old-fashioned boombox with cassette tapes labelled Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and greatest hits of the 40s. Chiron was so old, Piper wondered if that meant 1940s, 1840s or maybe just AD 40. But most of the office wall space was plastered with photos of demigods, like a hall of fame. One of the newer shots showed a teenage guy with dark hair and green eyes. Since he stood arm in arm with Annabeth, Piper assumed the guy must be Percy Jackson. In some of the older photos, 
she recognised famous people, businessmen, athletes, even some actors that her dad knew. Unbelievable, she muttered. Piper wondered if her photo would go on that wall someday. For the first time, she felt like she was part of something bigger than herself. Demigods had been around for centuries. Whatever she did, she did for all of them. She took a deep breath and made the call. The video screen popped up. Gleason Hedge grinned at her from her dad's office. Seen the news? Kind of hard to miss, Piper said. Hope you know what you're doing. Kyron had shown her a newspaper at lunch. Her dad's mysterious return from nowhere had made the front page. Her personal assistant Jane had been fired for covering up his disappearance and failing to notify the police. A new staff had been hired and personally vetted by Tristan McLean's life coach, Gleason Hedge. According to the paper, Mr McLean claimed to have no memory of the last week and the media was totally eating up the story. Some thought it was a clever marketing ploy for a movie. Maybe McLean was going to play an amz amnesiac. Some thought he'd been kidnapped by terrorists or rabid fans or had heroically escaped from ransom seekers using his incredible King of Sparta fighting skills. Whatever the truth, Tristan McLean was more famous than ever. It's going great, Hedge promised, but don't worry. We're going to keep him out of the public eye for the next month or so until things cool down. Your dad's got more important things to do, like resting and talking to his daughter. Don't get too comfortable out there in Hollywood, Gleason, Piper said. Hedge snorted. You're kidding. These people make Aeolus look sane. I'll be back as soon as I can, but your dad's got to get back on his feet first. He's a good guy. Oh, and by the way, I took care of that other little matter. The park service in the Bayer area uh, just got an anonymous gift of a new helicopter. And that ranger pilot who helped us, well, she's got a very lucrative offer to fly for Mr. McLean. Thanks, Gleason, Piper said, for everything. Yeah, well, I don't try to be awesome. It just comes natural. Speaking of Aeolus's place, uh, meet your dad's new assistant. Hedge was nudged out of the way and a pretty young lady grinned into the camera. Melly, Piper stared, but it was definitely her. The aura who'd helped them escape from Aeolus's fortress. You're working for my dad now. Isn't it great? Does he know you're a, you know, a wind spirit? Oh no, but I love this job. It's um, a breeze. Piper couldn't help but laugh. I'm glad. That's awesome. But where? Just a sec. Melly kissed Gleason on the cheek. Come on, you old goat. Stop hogging the screen. What? Hedge demanded. But Melly steered him away and called, Mr. McLean, she's on. A second later, pa Piper's dad appeared. He broke into a huge grin. Pipes! He looked great. Back to normal with his sparkling brown eyes, his half-day beard, his confident smile and his newly trimmed hair, like he was ready to shoot a scene. Piper was relieved, but she also felt a little sad. Back to normal wasn't necessarily what she'd wanted. In her mind, she started the clock. On a normal call like this, on a work day, she hardly ever got her dad's attention for longer than 30 seconds. Hey, she said weakly, you feeling okay? Honey, I'm so sorry to worry you with this disappearance business. I don't know. His smile wavered, and she could tell he was trying to remember, grasping for a memory that should have been there but wasn't. I'm not sure what happened, honestly, but I'm fine. Coach Hedge has been a godsend. A godsend, she repeated. Funny choice of words. He told me about your new school, Dad said. I'm sorry the wilderness school didn't work out, but you were right. Jane was wrong. I was a fool to listen to her. Ten seconds later, maybe. But at least her dad sounded sincere, like he really did feel remorseful. You don't remember anything, she said, a bit wistfully. Of course I do, he said. A chill went down her neck. You do. I remember that I love you, he said, and I'm proud of you. Are you happy at your new school? Piper blinked. She wasn't going to cry now. After all she'd been through, that would be ridiculous. Yeah, Dad. It's more like a camp, not a school, but yeah, I, I think I'll be happy here. Call me as often as you can, he said, and come home for Christmas. A and Pipes? Yes. He touched the screen as if trying to reach through with his hand. You're a wonderful young lady. I don't tell you that often enough. You remind me so much of your mother. She'd be proud. And Grandpa Tom. He chuckled. He always said you'd be the most powerful voice in our family. You're going to outshine me someday, you know. They're going to remember me as Piper McLean's father, and that's the best legacy I can imagine. Piper tried to answer, but she was afraid she'd break down. She just touched her, his fingers on the screen and nodded. Melly said something in the background, and her dad sighed. Ah, studio calling. I'm sorry, honey. And he did sound genuinely annoyed to go. It's okay, Dad, she managed. Love you. He winked, and then the video call went black. 45 seconds, maybe a full minute. Piper smiled. A small improvement, but it was progress. At the commons area, she found Jason relaxing on a bench, a basketball between his feet. He was sweaty from working out, but he looked great in his orange tank top and shorts. His various scars and bruises from the quest were healing, thanks to some medical attention from the Apollo cabin. His arms and legs were well-muscled and tan, distracting as always. 
His close-cropped ha blonde hair caught the afternoon light, so it looked like it was turning to gold, Midas style. Hey, he said, how did it go? It took her a second to focus on his question. Hmm, huh? Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, fine. She sat next to him, and they watched the campers going back and forth. A couple of Demeter girls were playing tricks on two of the Apollo guys, making grass grow around their ankles as they shot baskets. Over at the camp store, the Hermes kids were putting up a sign that read, Flying shoes, slightly used, 50% off today. Ares kids were lining their cabin with fresh barbed wire. The Hypnos cabin was snoring away, a normal day at camp. Meanwhile, the Aphrodite kids were watching Piper and Jason and trying to pretend they weren't. Piper was pretty sure she saw money change hands, like they were placing bets on a kiss. Get any sleep? She asked him. He looked at her as if she'd been reading his thoughts. Not much. Dreams? About your past? He nodded. She didn't push him. If he wanted to talk, that was fine. But she knew him better than to press the subject. She didn't even worry that her knowledge of him was mostly based on three months of false memories. You can sense possibilities, her mother had said, and Piper was determined to make those possibilities a reality. Jason spun his basketball. It's not good news, he warned. My memories aren't good for... for any of us. Piper was pretty sure he'd been about to say for us, as in the two of them, and she wondered if he'd remembered a girl from his past. But she didn't let it bother her, not on a sunny winter day like this, with Jason next to her. We'll figure it out, she promised. He looked at her hesitantly, like he wanted very much to believe her. Annabeth and Rachel are coming in for the meeting tonight. I should probably wait until then to explain. Okay. She plucked a blade of grass by her foot. She knew there was dangerous things in store for both of them. She would have to compete with Jason's past, and they might not even survive their war against the giants. But right now, they were both alive, and she was determined to enjoy this moment. Jason studied her warily. His forearm tattoo was faint blue in the sunlight. You're in a good mood? How can you be so sure things will work out? Because you're going to lead us, she said simply. I'd follow you anywhere. Jason blinked, and then slowly he smiled. Dangerous thing to say. I'm a dangerous girl. That, I believe. He got up and brushed off his shorts. He offered her a hand. Leo says he's got something to show us out in the woods. You coming? Wouldn't miss it. She took his hand and stood up. For a moment, they kept holding hands. Jason tilted his head. We should get, get, should get going. Yep, she said. Just a sec. She let go of his hand and took a card from her pocket. The silver calling card that Thalia had given her for the hunters of Artemis. She dropped it into a nearby eternal fire and watched it burn. There would be no breaking hearts in Aphrodite cabin from now on. That was one rite of passage they didn't need. Across the green, her cabin mates looked disappointed that they hadn't witnessed a kiss. They started cashing in on their bets. But that was all right. Piper was patient, and she could see lots of good possibilities. Let's go, she told Jason. We've got adventures to plan. Chapter 53. Leo. Leo hadn't felt this jumpy since he'd offered tofu burgers to the werewolves, when he got to the limestone cliff in the forest, he turned to the group and smiled nervously. Here we go. He willed his hand to catch fire and set it against the door. His cabin mates gasped. Leo, Nissa cried. You're a fire user. Yeah, thanks, he said. I, I know. Jake Mason, who was out of his body cast but still on crutches, said, Holy Hephaestus, that means it's so rare, that. The massive stone door swung open and everyone's mouth dropped. Leo's flaming hand seemed insignificant now. Even Piper and Jason looked stunned and they'd seen enough amazing things lately. Only Chiron didn't look surprised. The centaur knitted his bushy eyebrows and stroked his beard, as if the group were about to walk through a minefield. That made Leo even more nervous, but he couldn't change his mind now. His instincts told him he was meant to share this place, at least with the Hephaestus cabin, and he couldn't hide it from Chiron or his two best friends. Welcome to Bunker 9, he said, as confidently as he could. Come on in. The group was silent as they toured the facility, Everything was just as Leo had left it. Giant machines, work tables, old maps and schematics. Only one thing had changed. Festus's head was sitting on the central table, still battered and scorched from his final crash in Omaha. Leo went over to it, a bitter taste in his mouth, and stroked the dragon's forehead. I'm sorry, Festus, but I won't forget you. Jason put a hand on Leo's shoulder. Hephaestus brought it here for you? Leo nodded. But you can't repair him, Jason guessed. No way, Leo said, but the head is going to be reused. Festus will be going with us. Piper came over and frowned. What do you mean? Before Leo could answer, Nyssa cried out, Guys, look at this. She was standing at one of the work tables, flipping through a sketchbook, diagrams for hundreds of different machines and weapons. I've never seen anything like this, Nyssa said. There are more amazing ideas here than in Daedalus's workshop. 
It would take a century just to prototype them all. Who built this place? Jake Mason said. And why? Chiron stayed silent, but Leo focused on the wall map he'd, been he'd seen during his first visit. It showed Camp Halfblood with a line of tyrams in the sound, catapults mounted in the hills around the valley, and spots marked for traps, trenches and ambush sites. It's a wartime command centre, he said. The camp was attacked once, wasn't it? In the Titan War, Piper asked. Nisha shook her head. No. Besides, that map looks really old. The date. Does that say 1864? They all turned to Chiron. The centaur's tail swished fretfully. This camp has been attacked many times, he admitted. That map is from the last civil war. Apparently, Leo wasn't the only one confused. The other Hephaestus campers looked at each other and frowned. Civil war, Piper said. You mean the American civil war, like 150 years ago? Yes and no, Chiron said. The two conflicts, mortal and demigod, mirrored each other as they usually do in Western history. Look at any civil war or revolution from the fall of Rome onward, and it marks a time when demigods also fought, also fought one another. But that civil war was particularly horrible. For American mortals, it is still their bloodiest conflict of all time, worse than their casualties in the two world wars. For demigods, it was equally devastating. Even back then, this valley was Camp Halfblood. There was a horrible battle in those woods, lasting for days with terrible losses on both sides. Both sides, Leo said. You mean the camp split apart? No, Jason spoke up. He means two different groups. Camp Halfblood was one side in the war. Leo wasn't sure he wanted an answer, but he asked, Who was the other? Chiron glanced up at the tattered Bunker 9 banner, as if remembering the day it was raised. The answer is dangerous, he warned. It is something I swore upon the River Styx never to speak of. After the American Civil War, the guards were so horrified by the toll it took on their children that they swore it would never happen again. The two groups were separated. The guards bent all their will, wove the mist as tightly as they could to make sure the enemies never remembered each other, never met on their quests so that bloodshed could be avoided. This map is from the final dark days of 1864, the last time the two groups fought. We've had several post calls since then. The 1960s were particularly dicey, but we've managed to avoid another civil war, at least so far. Just as Leo guessed, this bunker was a command centre for the Hephaestus cabin. In the last century, it had been reopened a few times, usually as a hiding place in times of great unrest. But coming here is dangerous. It stirs old memories, awakens old feuds. Even when the Titans threatened last year, I did not think it worth the risk to use this place. Suddenly, Leo's sense of triumph turned to guilt. Hey, look, this, this place found me. It was meant to happen. It's a good thing. I hope you're right, Chiron said. I am. Leo pulled the old drawing out of his pocket and spread it on the table for everyone to see. Then, he said proudly, Aeolus returned that to me. I drew it when I was five. That's my destiny. Nyssa frowned. Leo, it's a crayon drawing of a boat. Look, he pointed at the larger schematic on the bulletin board, the blueprint showing a Greek terrain. Slowly, his cabin mate's eyes widened as they compared the two designs. The number of masts and oars, even the decorations on the shields and sails, were exactly the same as on Leo's drawing. That's impossible, Nissa said. That blueprint has to be a century old at least. Prophecy. Unclear. Flight. Jake Mason read from the notes on the blueprint. It's a diagram for a flying ship. Look, that's the landing gear and weaponry. Holy Hephaestus, rotating ballista, mounted crossbows, celestial bronze plating. That thing would be one spanking hot war machine. Was it ever made? Not yet, Leo said. Look at the masthead. There was no doubt the figure at the front of the ship was the head of a dragon. A very particular dragon. Festus, Piper said. Everyone turned and looked at the dragon's head sitting on the table. He's meant to be our masthead, Leo said. Our good luck charm. Our eyes are at sea. I'm supposed to build this ship. I'm going to call it the Argo 2. And guys, I'll need your help. The Argo 2, Piper smiled. After Jason's ship. Jason looked a little uncomfortable, but he nodded. Leo's right. That ship is just what we need for our journey. What journey? Nissa said. You just got back. Piper ran her fingers over the old crayon drawing. We've got to confront Porphyrian, the giant king. He said he would destroy the gods at their roots. Indeed, Chiron said. Much of Rachel's great prophecy is still a mystery to me, but one thing is clear. You three, Jason, Piper and Leo, are among the seven demigods who must take on the quest. You must confront the giants in their homeland, where they are strongest, you must stop them before they can wake Gaia fully, before they destroy Mount Olympus. Um, Nissa shifted. You don't mean Manhattan, do you? No, Leo said. The original, Mount Olympus. We have to sail to Greece. Chapter 54. Leo. 
It took a few minutes for that to settle in, and then the other Hephaestus campers started asking questions all at once. Who were the other four demigods? How long would it take to build the boat? Why didn't everyone get to go to Greece? Heroes! Chiron struck his hoof on the floor. All the details are not clear yet, but Leo is correct. He will need your help to build the Argo too. It is perhaps the greatest project Cabin 9 has ever undertaken, even greater than the Bronze Dragon. It'll take a year at least, Nissa guessed. Do we have that much time? You have six months at most, Chiron said. You should sail by summer solstice, when the god's power is strongest. Besides, we evidently cannot trust the wind gods, and the summer winds are the least powerful and easiest to navigate. You dare not sail any later, or you may be too late to stop the giants. You must avoid ground travel, using only air and sea, so this vehicle is perfect. Jason being the son of the sky god. His voice trailed off, but Leo figured Chiron was thinking about his missing student, Percy Jackson, the son of Poseidon. He would have been good in this voyage too. Jake Mason turned to Leo. Well, one thing's for sure. You are now senior counsellor. This is the biggest honour the cabin has ever had. Anyone object? Nobody did. All his cabin mates smiled at him and Leo could almost feel their cabin's curse breaking, their sense of hopelessness melting away. It's official then, Jake said. You're the man. For once, Leo was speechless. Ever since his mum died, he'd spent his life on the run. Now he'd found a home and a family. He'd found a job to do. And as scary as it was, Leo wasn't tempted to run. Not even a little. Well, he said at last, if you guys elect me leader, you must be even crazier than I am. So let's build a spanking hot war machine. Chapter 55. Jason. Jason waited alone in cabin one. Annabeth and Rachel were due any minute for the head counsellor's meeting, and Jason needed time to think. His dreams the night before had been worse than he'd wanted to share, even with Piper. His memory was still foggy, but bits and pieces were coming back. The night Looper had tested him at the wolf house to decide if he would be a pup or food. Then, the long trip south to... Well, he couldn't remember, but he had flashes of his old life. The day he'd got his tattoo, the day he'd been raised on a shield and proclaimed a praetor. His friends' faces. Dakota. Gwendolyn, Hazel, Bobby and Rayner. Definitely, there'd been a girl named Rayner. He wasn't sure what she'd meant to him, but the memory made him question what he felt about Piper and wonder if he was doing something wrong. The problem was, he liked Piper a lot. Jason moved his stuff to the corner, alcove, where his sister had once slept. He put Thalia's photograph back on the wall so he didn't feel alone. He stared up at the frowning statue of Zeus, mighty and proud, but the statue didn't scare him anymore. It just made him feel sad. I know you can hear me, Jason said to the statue. The statue said nothing. Its painted eyes seemed to stare at him. I wish I could talk with you in person, Jason continued, but I understand you can't do that. The Roman gods don't like to interact, interact with mortals so much, and, well, you're the king. You've got to set an example. More silence. Jason had hoped for something, a bigger-than-usual rumble of thunder, a bright light, a smile. No, never mind. A smile would have been creepy. I remember some things, he said. The more he talked, the less self-conscious he felt. I remember that it's hard being a son of Jupiter. Everyone is always looking at me to be a leader, but I always feel alone. I guess you feel the same way up on Olympus. The other gods challenge your decisions. Sometimes you've got to make hard choices, and the others criticise you, and you can't come to my aid like other gods might. You've got to keep me at a distance, so it doesn't look like you're playing favourites. I guess I just wanted to say... Jason took a deep breath. I understand all that. It's okay. I'm going to try to do my best. I'll try to make you proud, but I could really use some guidance, Dad. If there's anything you can do, help me so I can help my friends. I'm afraid I'll get them killed. I don't know how to protect them. The back of his neck tingled. He realised someone was standing behind him. He turned and found a woman in a black hooded robe with a goatskin cloak over her shoulders and a sheathed Roman sword, a gladius in her hands. Hera, he said. She pushed back her hood. To you, I've always been Juno. And your father has already sent you guidance, Jason. He sent you Piper and Leo. They're not just your responsibility. They are also your friends. Listen to them. And you will do well. Did Jupiter send you here to tell me that? No one sends me anywhere, hero, she said. I'm not a messenger. But you got me into this. Why did you send me to this camp? I think you know, Juno said. An exchange of leaders was necessary. It was the only way to bridge the gap. I didn't agree to it. No, but Zeus gave your life to me and I am helping you to fulfil your destiny. Jason tried to control his anger. He looked down at his orange camp shirt and the tattoos on his arm, and he knew these things should not go together. He had become a contradiction, a mixture as dangerous as anything Medea could cook up. You've... you're not going to give me all my memories, he said, even though you promised. Most will return in time, Juno said, 
but you must find your own way back. You need these next months with your new friends, your new home. You're gaining their trust. By the time you sail in your ship, you will be a leader at this camp and you'll be ready to be a peacemaker between two great powers. What if you're not telling the truth? He asked. What if you're doing this to cause another civil war? Juno's expression was impossible to read. Amusement? Disdain? Affection? Possibly all three. As much as the human, she appeared human, Jason knew she was not. He could still see that blinding light, the true form of the goddess that had seared itself into his brain. She was Juno and Hera. She existed in many places at once. Her reasons for doing something were never simple. I am the goddess of family, she said. My family has been divided for too long. They divided us so we don't kill each other, Jason said. That seems like a pretty good reason. The prophecy demands that we change. The giants will rise. Each can only be killed by a god and demigod working together. Those demigods must be the seven greatest of the age. As it stands, they are divided between two places. If we remain divided, we cannot win. Gaia is counting on this. You must unite the heroes of Olympus and sail together to meet the giants on the ancient battlegrounds of Greece. Only then will the gods be convinced to join you. It will be the most dangerous quest, the most important voyage ever attempted by the children of the gods. Jason looked up again at the glowering statue of his father. It's not fair, Jason said. I could ruin everything. You could, Juno agreed. But gods need heroes. We always have. Even you? I thought you hated heroes. The goddess gave him a dry smile. I have that reputation, but if you want the truth, Jason, I often envy other gods their mortal children. You demigods can span both worlds. I think this helps your godly parents. Even Jupiter, curse him, to understand the mortal world better than I. Juno sighed so unhappily that despite his anger, Jason almost felt sorry for her. I am the goddess of marriage, she said. It is not in my nature to be faithless. I have only two godly children, Ares and Hephaestus, both of whom are disappointments. I have no moral heroes to do my bidding, which is why I am so often bitter towards demigods, Heracles, Aeneas, all of them. But it is also why I favoured the first Jason, a pure mortal who had no godly parent to guide him, and why I am glad Zeus gave you to me. You will be my champion, Jason. You will be the greatest of heroes and bring unity to the demigods and thus to Olympus. Her words settled over him as heavy as sandbags. Two days ago, he'd been terrified by the idea of leading demigods into a great prophecy, sailing off to battle the giants and save the world. He was still terrified, but something had changed. He no longer felt alone. He had friends now and a home to fight for. He even had a patron goddess looking out for him, which had to count for something, even if she seemed a little untrustworthy. Jason had to stand up and accept his destiny, just as he had done when he faced Porphyrion with his bare hands. Sure, it seemed impossible. He might die, but his friends were counting on him. And if I fail, he asked. Great victory requires great risk, she admitted. Fail and there will be bloodshed like we have never seen. Demigods will destroy one another. The giants will overrun Olympus. Gaia will wake and the earth will shake off everything we have built over five millennia. It will be the end of us all. Great, uh, just great. Someone pounded on the cabin doors. Juno pulled her hood back over her face, and then she handed Jason the sheathed gladius. Take this for the weapon you lost. We will speak again. Like it or not, Jason, I am your sponsor and your link to Olympus. We need each other. The goddess vanished as the doors creaked open, and Piper walked in. Annabeth and Rachel are here, she said. Chiron has summoned the council. Chapter 56. Jason. The council was nothing like Jason imagined. For one thing, it was in the big house rec room, around a ping-pong table, and one of the satyrs was serving nachos and sodas. Somebody had brought Seymour the leopard head in from the living room and hung him on the wall. Every once in a while, a counsellor would toss him a sausage. Jason looked around the room and tried to remember everyone's name. Thankfully, Leo and Piper were sitting next to him. It was their first meeting as senior counsellors. Clarice, leader of the Ares cabin, had her boots on the table, but nobody seemed to care. Clovis, from Hypnos Cabin, was snoring in the corner, while Butch, from Iris Cabin, was seeing how many pencils he could fit in Clovis's nostrils. Travis Stoll, from Hermes, was holding a lighter under a ping-pong ball to see if it would burn, and Will Solis, from Apollo, was absently wrapping and unwrapping a bandage around his wrist. The counsellor from Hecate Cabin, Lou Ellen, something or other, was playing Got Your Nose with Miranda Gardner from Demeter, except that Lou Ellen really had magically disconnected Miranda's nose, and Miranda was trying to get it back. Jason had hoped Thalia would show. She'd promised, after all, but she was nowhere to be seen. Chiron had told him not to worry about it. Thalia often got sidetracked fighting monsters or running quests for Artemis, and she would probably arrive soon. But still, Jason worried. Rachel Dare, the oracle, sat next to Chiron at the head of the table. 
She was wearing her Clarion Academy school uniform dress, which I, seemed a bit odd, but she smiled at Jason. Annabeth didn't look so relaxed. She wore armour over her camp clothes, with her knife at her side and her blonde hair pulled back in a ponytail. As soon as Jason walked in, she fixed him with an expectant look, as if she were trying to extract information out of him by sheer willpower. Let's come to order, Kyron said. Llewellyn, please give Miranda her nose back. Travis, if you'd kindly extinguish, extinguish the flaming ping-pong ball. And Butch, I think 20 pencils is really too many for any human nostril. Thank you. Now, as you can see, Jason, Piper and Leo have returned successfully, more or less. Some of you have heard parts of their story, but I will let them fill you in. Everyone looked at Jason. He cleared his throat and began the story. Piper and Leo chimed in from time to time, filling in the details he forgot. It only took a few minutes, but it seemed like longer with everyone watching him. The silence was heavy, and for so many ADHD demigods to sit still listening for that long, Jason knew the story must have sounded pretty wild. He ended with Hera's visit, right before the meeting. So Hera was here, Annabeth said, talking to you. Jason nodded. Look, I I'm not saying I trust her. That's smart, Annabeth said. But she isn't making this up about another group of demigods. That's where I came from. Romans, Clarice tossed Seymour a snossage. You expect us to believe there's a another camp with demigods, but they follow the Roman forms of the gods, and we've never even heard of them? Piper sat forward. The gods have kept the two groups apart because every time they see each other, they try to kill each other. I can respect that, Clarice said. Still, why haven't we either ever run across each other on quests? Oh yes, Chiron said sadly. You have many times. It's always a tragedy, and always the gods do their best to wipe clean the memories of those involved. The rivalry goes all the way back to the Trojan War, Clarice. The Greeks invaded Troy and burned it to the ground. The Trojan hero Aeneas escaped and eventually made his way to Italy, where he found the race that would someday become Rome. The Romans grew more and more powerful, worshipping the same gods but under different names and with slightly different personalities. More warlike, Jason said. More united. More about expansion, conquest and discipline. Yuck, Travis put in. Several of the others looked equally uncomfortable, though Clarice shrugged like it sounded okay to her. Annabeth twirled her knife on the table. And the Romans hated the Greeks. They took revenge when they conquered the Greek Isles and made them part of the Roman Empire. Not exactly hated them, Jason said. The Romans admired Greek culture and were a little jealous. In return, the Greeks thought the Romans were barbarians, but they respected their military power. So during Roman times, demigods started to divide, either Greek or Roman. And it's been that way ever since, Annabeth guessed. But this is crazy, Chiron. Where were the Romans during the Titan War? Didn't they want to help? Chiron tugged at his beard. They did help, Hanabeth. While you and Percy were leading the battle to save Manhattan, who do you think conquered Mount Orifice? The Titan's base in California. Hold on, Travis said. You said Mount Orifice just crumbled when we beat Kronos. No, Jason said. He remembered flashes of the battle, a giant in starry armour and a helm mounted with ram's horns. He remembered his army of demigods scaling Mount Tam, fighting through hordes of snake monsters. It didn't just fall. We destroyed their palace. I defeated the Titan Krios myself. Annabeth's eyes were as stormy as Ventus. Jason could almost see her thoughts moving, putting the pieces together. The Bay Area. We demigods were always told to stay away from it because Mount Orifice was there. But that wasn't the only reason, was it? The Roman camp. It's got to be somewhere near San Francisco. I bet it was put there to keep watch on the Titan's territory. Where is it? Chiron shifted in his wheelchair. I cannot say, honestly, even I have never been trusted with that information. My counterpart, Looper, is not exactly the sharing type. Jason's memory, too, has been burned away. The camp's heavily veiled with magic, Jason said, and heavily guarded. We could search for years and never find it. Rachel Dare laced her fingers. Of all the people in the room, only she didn't seem nervous about the conversation. But you'll try, won't you? You'll build Leo's boat, the Argo too, and before you make for Greece... You'll sail for the Roman camp. You'll need their help to confront the giants. Bad plan, Clarice warned. If those Romans see a warship coming, they'll assume we're attacking. You're probably right, Jason agreed. But we have to try. I was sent here to learn about Camp Half-Blood, to try to convince you the two camps don't have to be enemies. A peace offering. Hmm, Rachel said. Because Hera is convinced we need both camps to win the war and win with the giants. Seven heroes of Olympus. Some Greek. Some Roman. Annabeth nodded. Your great prophecy. What's the last line? And foes here, well, foes bear arms to the doors of death. Gaia has opened the doors of death, Annabeth said. She's letting out the worst villains of the underworld to fight us. Medea, Midas, there'll be more, I'm sure. 
Maybe the line means that the Roman and Greek demigods will unite and find the doors and close them. Or it could mean they fight each other at the doors of death, Clarice pointed out. It doesn't say we'll cooperate. There was silence as the campers let that happy thought sink in. I'm going, Annabeth said. Jason, when you get this ship built, let me go with you. I was hoping you'd offer, Jason said. You of all people, <laughs> we'll need you. Wait, Leo frowned. I mean, that's cool with me and all, but why Annabeth of all people? Annabeth and Jason studied one another, and Jason knew she had to put, she'd had to put put it together. She saw the dangerous truth. Hera said my coming here was an exchange of leaders, Jason said, a way for the two camps to learn of each other's existence. Yeah, Leo said. So? An exchange goes two ways, Jason said. When I got here, my memory was wiped. I didn't know who I was or where I belonged. Fortunately, you guys took me in, and I found a new home. I know you're not my enemy. The Roman camp... They're not so friendly. You prove your worth quickly or you don't survive. But they may not be so nice to him. And if they learn where he comes from, he's going to be in serious trouble. Him, Leo said. Who are you talking about? My boyfriend, Annabeth said grimly. He disappeared around the same time Jason appeared. If Jason came to Camp Half-Blood. Exactly, Jason agreed. Percy Jackson is at the other camp and he probably doesn't even remember who he is.